Hi everyone, my name is Kevin Lin and I'm a graduate student working with both Chad Myers and Anya Belinsky at the University of Minnesota. I want to take a quick second to thank the organizers of GLBio for inviting me to give this short talk. Today I'll be presenting on predicting chemical mode of action through targeted CRISPR screens. To motivate this project, I'll first discuss current drug discovery approaches, which are generally target-centric. What this means is that you have a protein target of interest, you build a functional assay around this target, and then use that assay to conduct high-throughput screens against large compound libraries, hoping for some hits. Now, this approach is inherently limited because you have to develop a separate individual functional assay for each target. So this begs the question, can we make drug discovery more efficient? An alternative approach would be compound-centric drug discovery. So what that means is that you start with a compound and understand precisely what target it hits. If you can build this method for one drug and then scale that same method across multiple drugs, then we can begin to rapidly annotate large compound collections. The method in question involves understanding chemical genetic screens, which involve a genome-wide deletion library and then interrogating each gene deletion and whether it confers sensitivity or resistance in the presence of the drug. And you see here that you're beginning to build these fingerprint uh, CGI profiles that tell you something about the drug mode of action. What you can do with the same deletion library is interrogate whether these gene deletions are conferring an unexpected fitness effect in the presence of another query gene knockout. So what you are building out here on the right side are genetic interaction profiles. And what's cool about this is that you can find profile similarities between the drug profiles and genetic interaction profiles. And if they look very similar, then you can infer, for example, that this drug is targeting gene A. Previous work in the Myers lab have leveraged these ideas in yeast, which is a tractable model system for building out these genetic interaction profiles. And so you see here on the left, collapsing those profiles into a genetic interaction network, um, and then bending each of these query genes uh, into biological function processes. Um, and then on the right, uh, this paper took six large compound collections uh, and then employed the idea of integrating CGI and GI profiles to rapidly annotate the biological functions of these compounds. So next, we try to understand, can we translate this approach to mammalian systems? To approach this in human cell lines, we employ a pooled lentiviral CRISPR screen approach. So briefly, you take a Cas9 expressing cell line, you transduce a genome-wide guide library, and at the start of the screen, you split this into a control versus drug arm. You let the screen run out over a certain amount of time, and at the end of the screen, you isolate the DNA and send it off to next generation sequencing. And so the results that you get back are guide abundances that act as proxy for cell fitness. Um, so you're able to quantify the fitness effect uh, of end versus start of the screen um, for both the control and the drug arm. Um, and then taking the differential log volt change effect, you're essentially getting your CGI scores. And so over here on the x-axis, you're looking at control fitness versus compound fitness on the y-axis. And then drawing the sort of y equals x line, uh, points that fall to the left of the line would be positive uh, interactors, and points that fall to the right would be negative interactors. Um, and in taking all these CGI scores, you can then produce a drug profile. Genome-wide libraries consist of 70,000 or so guides targeting 18,000 or so genes. And from this picture over here, I hope you can appreciate that these genome-wide screens are just very costly and take up a lot of reagents. So this is obviously not a very scalable approach to compound-centric drug discovery. The proposed solution would be to compress this library uh, for human cell line work. Uh, and so on the right, I'm showing an example of the genome wide library and the profiles you can produce. But what if we could take the most informative columns 
um, and compress the information here down to this targeted library and then play the same game of matching drug profiles to GI profiles to predict drug mode of action. To see if the targeted library approach works, I conducted a proof of principle screen. So we developed a targeted library with 3,000 guides targeting 1,000 or so genes, most of which are focused on the DNA damage response. In addition, we have selected guides that have performed well in past CRISPR screens, that is, they give us the most informative columns, and we also added uh, frequent interactors to this list. Uh, the cell line of choice was RPE1, which is a relatively normal uh, human cell line. And the drug of choice was bortezomib at the IC50 concentration. So this drug was chosen because of two reasons. One, it has a well-characterized mode of action. And two, there have been genome-wide screens of bortezomib already done. Bortezomib is a proteasome inhibitor, and it's FDA approved for multiple myeloma. And we know in terms of its mode of action that bortezomib hits certain subunits of the 26S proteasome. On this slide, I'm showing some quality control plots for our screens. So on the very left, uh, we have five genome-wide bortezomib screens, and I calculated uh, Pearson correlation coefficients among their CGI scores uh, for each pair of replicates. I also did the same for the triplicates of targeted screens that we have. And you can see here that on the targeted screen side, you have better correlation here uh, than the genome-wide screens. On the far right, uh, we have set up an essential gene standard. Uh, these are genes that we expect to drop out over the course of a CRISPR screen. Um, and then measuring how well this, these are being picked up by our screens. Um, so with this AUC rock curve, uh, you can see that whether you have control or a drug arm, uh, both are doing pretty well in our targeted screens. Here I'm showing the CGI hits from our targeted bortism of screen. So it's sort of a sanity check. It's good to look at the positive side first, and you expect to see the drug's target to show up here. But that is that if you knock out the target of the drug, you would be suppressing the fitness effect of the drug. And so looking at our top positive hit, uh, PSMD6, this is the only proteosomal subunit in our library, uh, and that makes sense. Uh, on the negative side, uh, what the hits that you're picking up are sensitizing to the bortism of drug. Uh, and so it's interesting to see that the top three hits, uh, DDI2, NGLI1, and NFE2L1, are all involved in proteosomal processes. To compare the performance of the targeted library to the genome-wide library, I first define a gold standard hit list from the genome-wide screens. Uh, I then looked at the top 100 negative and the top 100 positive hits from my targeted screen. And so in red, I'm showing where these hits overlap, the gold standard hits. Uh, I also further did a hypergeometric overlap test on both the positive and negative side, and looking specifically at the top 40 hits. And you can see there is an enrichment uh, of gold standard hits on both sides. All of this is to say that these targeted screens are recapitulating the information that we expect from the genome-wide screens. So now that we have the Bortism of CGI profile, the next step would be to predict drug mode of action uh, by integrating its profile with genetic interaction profiles. And so this involves using a tool that was developed by a previous grad student in Jed Meyer's lab. Um, and this tool is called CGTarget, can be found in this link. Um, the idea is that you need three inputs. And one is the CGI profile, two would be the GI profiles, and these we grab from a project ongoing with our collaborators at the University of Toronto, um, where they have 180 queries or rows of this matrix filled out. Uh, and then we map these genes to go biological processes so that we can make process level predictions for the drug in question. CG Target produces a ranked list of gene target predictions for bortezomib, which is what I'm showing in the table below. Uh, you can see that PSMD2, which is a proteasome subunit, comes up on this list, as well as VCP, uh, and both genes have to do with protein turnover regulation. Now, what's also interesting is that two genes that are related to nervous system disorders, 
uh, ATX N2L, ATX N7 come up uh, near the top of this list. Um, and that's interesting because bortezomib has the side effect uh, called peripheral neuropathy, which precludes clinical usage of this drug. Moving on to process target predictions, you expect to see proteosomal GO terms to come up near the top of this list, and that's what you see here, uh, regulation of protein catabolic process that are driven by proteosomal subunits. So this is very promising, uh, sort of a validation that CG target is working as we expect it to. Um, I'll also point out again on the topic of the peripheral neuropathy side effect that several nervous system disorder GO terms come up towards the top of this list. Uh, this is something that we need to further validate, but this is interesting uh, to see in these results. To summarize, uh, CG target applied to this proof of principle screen has successfully identified gene level and process level targets that we expect for partizimib. Uh, this is a scalable way towards compound centric drug discovery. And what's nice about these targeted screens is that you can do them at 120 of the resource cost of genome-wide screens. And so this technology could enable uh, making these screens more available to more labs. Uh, this is a possible approach for annotating large compound libraries, like the work done in yeast, um, and also a powerful approach for exploring uncharacterized compounds or repurposing drugs. With that, I'd like to thank members from both the Belinsky and the Myers Lab as well as my funding sources from the CTSI TL1 program uh, and the NIH and CIF30. And during the live Q&A, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time.